spirits are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the from the les, a lesson from the Acts of the Apostles. Now the apostle and the believers who were in Judea heard the Gentiles had accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the crucified believers criticized him, saying, "Why did you go to the uncircumcised men and eat with them?" Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lured by its four corners. 
and it came close to me. And as I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Cicero arrived at the house where we were. The spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God.
A reading from the Revelation to John. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. At the Last Supper, when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. It's my understanding that last week you received two sermons in one service. And so I was tempted to skip the sermon this week in order to balance out the sermon to service ratio. But upon reading the lessons for today, I felt something must be said. 
Much of Christian life is that sense that upon hearing the Word of God, we must in some way respond. This building exists because of a response from people 120 years ago. This congregation exists because of generation after generation of people responding to God's call. Many of you are here today because at some point you responded to God calling you to the waters of baptism. Some of you are here today because you're actively responding to that call. And I am standing before you today because of my need to respond to God's call, not just to baptism, not just to the Episcopal Church, but to the priesthood of this church. I'm not sure whether I have ever told this story completely. I'm sure I've shared parts of it from the pulpit, but I often hesitate to be too personal. I don't want to abuse having a captive audience, or at least I don't want to make you feel captive. But 12 years ago, this June, I was working in Baton Rouge as a page in the House of Representatives. And while that summer is full of interesting stories, there is one particular, particularly germane to today's readings. I was 17, and between my junior and senior years in high school, and having grown up in a small town, I relished this opportunity to spend a summer in the city with no adult supervision. I quickly realized that being 17 severely limited my opportunity to get into any real trouble or have all that much fun, besides the standard fare of staying up late and watching Netflix. But there was a documentary that popped up called For the Bible Tells Me So. It was a fascinating collection of stories from LGBT Christians and other biblical scholars about what the Bible really says about LGBT people. And naturally, my curiosity was piqued. To this point in my life, I had pretty much sworn off of God more generally and the church specifically. I had determined a few years previous that if God had a problem with me, then so be it. But it could not escape, I could not escape, that nagging in the back of my mind that God really did exist, and maybe I should hear what these people have to say. So I watched the movie and was surprised, shocked even, to see that there was a church that had chosen and approved of a gay bishop, who in addition to being openly gay was openly partnered with another man. Some of you who have been in the Episcopal Church a while will remember and know Bishop Gene Robinson, who was elected bishop in Vermont all the way back in 2003. I watched Bishop Robinson tell his story. I heard him talk about his election, the protests, the death threats. I heard him say that his ordination, at his ordination as bishop, he wore a bulletproof vest under his alb, and I knew that not everyone in the church supported him becoming a bishop. But I was struck that not only was there a church where LGBT people could exist as themselves, but there was a church where they could even be in leadership. And that said something to me. Sure, it was massively controversial, as some of you remember vividly, but it happened. And I was shocked. So I started reading about the Episcopal Church. I, I went to the one closest to me, just a few blocks away. It was St. James Episcopal Church in Baton Rouge. And I walked into their offices and I asked the secretary, is there someone here that can tell me about the Episcopal Church? She said, I'll call the rector. I said, great, what's a rector? And so Father Mark Holland, whom some of you will know, his mother-in-law is a member down at St. James, and uh, he was a, a layman there. Uh, Father Mark Holland came down and took me to his office and for an hour or so answered just about every question that I had. The next Sunday I came to the Mass at his invitation. I can't remember the sermon, I can't remember the hymns, I can't remember which prayer was used. I do remember the shock of drinking real wine 
which having grown up in a church where drinking is not allowed was surprising, to say the least. And then from that moment on, I was Episcopalian. I learned how to say Episcopalian. I bought a book of common prayer, which I eventually learned how to use. And when I finally went to college, I started attending an Episcopal church somewhat regularly. There's not one in Oak Grove, so I had to wait until I got to the big city of Monroe to actually join a church. And I was glad to be Episcopalian. I was glad to be a part of a church that was bigger than my local parish, that stood in the history of Christianity, that had tradition, that had thoughtful sermons, that had Bible studies that didn't just focus on what the text said, but what it meant and that recognize the disagreement of Christians and that Christians can have about that and that the biblical authors themselves had. And after a year or so of this, I began to see that my relationship to the church, which I had previously held as judgmental and boring, had been made new. My relationship to Christ had been made new. My understanding of who God is had been made new. And suddenly the words that we read in Revelation this morning became real for me. God is the God who is making all things new. Or as Peter said in Acts today, I began to understand that there was a place even for people like me at the table. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? And they praise God, saying, Then God has given even to the gays the repentance that leads to life. Even to the Gentiles. Even to the poor. Even to the oppressed. Now, I loved that time in my life. I had found a place where I belonged, and being 19 years old and somewhat active in the life of a church made me a bit of a rock star with the church ladies, who were always so kind to me and still are. But there was still within me an inner turmoil. I was depressed, I was anxious. My junior year of college, that first semester, I skipped classes for two weeks in a row. I just couldn't seem to drag myself to, to go. I even skipped my media law class, which was my favorite class. And then at the invitation of my priest, I had gone to a Wednesday evening service at the church. The men's group was doing a Bible study, and there was going to be a dinner beforehand, and so being a poor college student, I could always find the strength to show up for a free meal. And so I dragged myself up to the church and found that I really enjoyed the company. The man had made some chili, and we all talked about whatever readings the priests had prepared, and, and it was a good time. And so I went back the next week, but there was no dinner. Still, I enjoyed the company. I started going to Mass that was held before the men's study, and I never could seem to get up to go on Sunday morning, and so the Wednesday Mass it was, and it was shorter. And after doing that for a few months, week after week, I discovered yet again that God was making all things new. On one evening in particular, when the priest broke the bread at the fraction, something I had probably witnessed 50 times to this point, I looked up. And the words from Prayer C, which we had used that night, echoed in my mind, Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. The wafer snapped, and it was like a bolt of lightning. This is what's happening here. The body of Christ in the hands of the priest is broken that Christ might be shared among us and made known to each of us personally. And behold, I am making all things new. From that moment on, if the church doors were open, I was there. If the bread was broken, I was getting a piece. I still had depression. I still had anxiety. The Eucharist was not a cure-all in that way. Community wasn't the medicine solely for that. But I'll tell you what, it made it bearable. 
It gave me the strength that I needed to get through it. It still does. It may not make me feel better necessarily, but it reminds me again and again that Christ stands ready in his brokenness to receive me in my brokenness. Then, after months of this, at 20 years old, I started having these dreams where I was celebrating the Eucharist. Nightmares. And being rightly disturbed at the very notion, I went to the priest in hopes that he would talk sense to me. Of course, you can't be a priest. You're too young. You're gay. You don't have any money for seminary. But he didn't have the decency to tell me any of that. You know what he said? We should explore this. That was not what I wanted to hear. I had a plan for my life, a plan that involved moving to a big city, making lots of money. I wanted to work in crisis management, not being a priest. But that's the joy of worshiping a God who is making all things new. At one point, the bishop had to be involved, and I thought, oh, good, someone who can be the adult in the room. Tell me no. Send me away. But even he insisted that there was something there. I felt a bit like St. Paul when he said that Christ appeared to Peter and then the twelve, and last of all, as the one untimely born, he appeared also to me. I was the last one to face the sacred music. I was the last to accept that God really did place a claim on my life. And so long story short, five years of discernment and training later, I'm kneeling before the bishop And he and the other clergy lay their hands on my head and call upon the Holy Spirit to make me a priest in his church. Many of you were there for that moment, almost three years ago now. And so I stand before you now, after almost a decade of training to be and actually being a pastor, priest, and teacher, three years of seminary, three years of ministry, two years of unprecedented global crisis, all of which has been filled with joy and pain, gain and loss, triumph and tragedy, I stand before you now today to witness week in and week out that God really is making all things new. Or as I jokingly said when Deacon Michael Parham joined me as being the second uh, openly LGBT person to be ordained in this diocese, the Lord is making old queens new. But all of this is to say that if God can take a pudgy, poor little gay boy with anxiety from West Carroll Parish and make him a priest, then God can do anything. I mean, seriously, I am the youngest rector in this diocese. I'm the only gay one. I'm getting married to a Jewish guy, and I only mention all of this to say that I am not the standard image that one has when one thinks of a priest. And yet, despite any comments about who I am, my age, my family, despite any number of people who'd rather I'd not stand before you today in this pulpit, or in any pulpit for that matter, despite any and all reasons why I shouldn't be here, here I stand. And I don't mention any of this to display my own success or righteousness. I am a sinner And I'm happy to provide you with a litany of my failures and shortcomings. But I simply wish to point out that God, one, God has an incredible sense of humor and that he has made me a priest. Two, God really is making all things new. And just when you think you've got it figured out, look again. Because God is just around the corner. If you'll allow me a short digression... I just returned from our diocesan clergy retreat, and the bishop is encouraging us to seek out those in our congregations who feel a call to priesthood or the diaconate. Following COVID, the clergy shortage has only gotten worse in our church, and there are six openings for every person currently in seminary. And in our diocese, more and more priests are nearing retirement age. So if there is anything about my story today that makes you think, huh, maybe I can be called to this life. Please come and talk to me. Being a priest or a deacon is very challenging, but it's also very rewarding, meaningful, and sometimes it's even fun. But even if you're not called to the ministerial priesthood, 
You are called to something. So where is that pudgy little gay boy with anxiety in your life? What's the thing that you think is holding you back? Find it. Because it's exactly there where God is waiting to surprise you. It's exactly that thing that God is going to use to display his glory in the world. For God has chosen what is weak to shame the strong and what is foolish to confound the wise. And that very thing about you that you find shameful or weak or a hindrance is going to be the locus of your own sanctification. It's going to start right there. Like a baby born in the middle of nowhere to a couple of nobodies or a crucified prophet laid in a tomb, it is exactly when you think God has stopped that he starts. It is exactly where you think he's left that he shows up, and it is exactly who you think he's cast off that he calls into service. Up is down, left is right, virgins are mothers, a baby is God, the dead are raised, and you, yes, you, are called, chosen, and claimed for the kingdom where all of this is possible. As First Peter says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, 
Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use and conserve its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, we thank you for the blessing of our blessings of our lives. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation, especially Steve, Stella, Ellen, Mark, Nikki, Mary, Margaret, Sarah Lou, John, Drew Dodson family, Buzzy, Maggie, John, Richard and Sandra, Josh, Mike, Zoe, Anne Marie, Robert, Elizabeth, Peggy Kirkland and family, David, Richard, Maureen, Mim, Della, Sammy, Jesse, Kelly, Brady, Mary Ann, Linda Sermon and family, Angela, Paul, Catherine and Paul, Robert, Cynthia, Louis, David, Connie, Mary, Cheryl, Bill, the people of Ukraine. Are there others? Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. we commend to your mercy all who have died. Amen. That your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. We pray also for those preparing to receive holy baptism in this church, especially Chelsea and Winnie. O God, our King, by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, on the first day of the week, you conquered sin, put death to flight, and gave us the hope of everlasting life. Redeem all our days by this victory. Forgive our sins. Banish our fears and make us bold to praise you and to do your will, and steal us to wait for the consummation of your kingdom on that last great day, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. 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 Estoy muy bien. Uh, I had a great time in Mexico. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to catch up with friends and, and soak up the sun. Uh, Ginger had asked me this morning uh, how, I, how I enjoyed it. I said, I am tanned, rested, and ready. Uh, we also had a wonderful clergy retreat uh, later, late last week uh, with the clergy of the diocese that I mentioned, uh, at which I learned a few things. One, the bishop is coming on August 21st. Uh, and so if you need to be confirmed or received into the church, let me know. We need to get you on the list. He's showing up sooner than I anticipated, uh, like a thief in the night. We need to get ready. Uh, and so if you have not been confirmed yet and you wish to be or not been received yet and you wish to be, uh, let me know so we can get the class started. It's looking like we're going to start at the uh, second week of July, and that'll give us plenty of time to get everybody uh, ready to go. Uh, other thing is William... Uh, Raymond graduated yesterday. What was his major read? Uh, he majored in petroleum engineer and had two minor geology and math. 
All right. And so congratulations to William. I know you're watching online right now, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, and then the uh, other news is June 1st at 6 p.m. will be my institution as rector uh, here at Holy Cross. We have put this off uh, for a while due to COVID, uh, but now we are, we're going to do it. So we're going to have my institution. Uh, the music will be phenomenal. Uh, very much looking forward to that. And then if you read the newsletter, we will have a guest preacher that Wednesday, uh, the Reverend Patricia Merchant, or Pat, as she likes to be known. Uh, Pat is the second woman uh, to be regularly ordained a priest in the Episcopal Church and uh, is a friend of mine from the Diocese of Atlanta, and so she will be coming to preach at that institution, and so we are looking forward to that. Any other news or announcements that I might be forgetting? Okay, hearing none. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. resurrection 
of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us, and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity constancy and peace and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom all this we ask through your son jesus christ by him and with him and in him in the unity of the holy spirit all honor and glory is yours almighty father now and forever
And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.